Okay. So I've, I've rewritten this talk about three times in the last week um, uh, due to discussions that I've had both here at the conference, the XDC conference, and last week at the Plumbers and LinuxCon conferences. Um, I'm planning on rewriting pretty much most of the present extension in the next week or so, um, basically shuffling stuff around. So this is what this is my current thoughts. I'm hoping this will be uh, an interesting discussion point. I've got some questions in here to ask all of you. Um, and I'm hoping you're going to come up with ideas for how I can actually make this work. Uh, so what am I talking about today? I'm talking about two new extensions, the DRI3 extension and the present extension, which um, when combined together, provide the awesome power of DRI 3000. <laughs> oh, it was Eric who wouldn't let me name, name the extension DRI 3000, but I continue to use the name as the union of DRI 3 and present. And I don't think you can stop me from doing that. <laughs> <laughs> is there, I mean, is there any better name for a system than DRI 3K? It's great. I'm going to talk about the DRI 3 extension, um, the present extension. Um, we looked around for another name for the present extension. Um, there were some suggestions. I haven't found anything better that I like better. And it's my extension, so I get to pick the name. Um, I've got some discussion on synchronization between X and DRM that I've been working on. And uh, talking about the present redirection stuff, which uh, Owen Taylor suggested as the best solution to a bunch of performance problems. When, uh, that, that's kind of been the X solution for a long time. Whenever you have some complicated management problem you want to reduce uh, or want to externalize your management, you just redirect the problem to the application space. So we have window redirection, and we have composite extension, which does content redirection, and now we have present redirection, which does presentation redirection. It's awesome. Um, okay, so what is DRI3? DRI3 is the simplest extension I think I've ever written. It has a really simple, simple job. And if you can focus on exactly what its requirements are, it turns out that uh, DRI is actually a really easy thing to do. And all the pain that we've had over DRI1 and DRI2 just go away. Um, the only thing that DRI3, the DRI3 extension is designed to do, is to share uh, a DMA buff and to link DMA buffs to XPix maps. So an application can draw stuff into a DMA buff and hand it to the X server and it can become a Pix map with the same contents. Or an application can take a Pix map and turn it into a DMA buff. A really simple job. There's your direct rendering. A DMA buff is a direct rendering target. An XPix map is an X rendering target. And this, the, D, the DRI3 extension just links those two together. Um, in order to make this work a little nicer, we also are sharing some synchronization objects with the DRI3 extension. That's so I can serialize execution in the application with execution in the Windows system, in the X server. So you have an application drawing to a, drawing to a DMA buff, and then you have the X server sucking bits out of a DMA buff. You kind of need to make sure that the application drawing to the DMA buff finishes before the X server starts pulling data out of the DMA buff. Um, with the Intel chip, uh, with Intel current Intel kernel <coughs> architecture, this is really trivial because if you flush all of your drawing to the kernel, then the kernel will nicely serialize all access to the all access to the video card, and so all access to your Pix maps or DMA buffs in this case also gets serialized. Um, on other cards, not so much. Uh, the NVIDIA card has multiple streams. A lot of the embedded cards have multiple streams as well, so we need to make sure that we can do explicit synchronization instead of implicit synchronization. And so the requirement for the DRI3 extension is to be able to make sure we can share these explicit synchronization objects, whatever they may be, between the application and the X server. Um, and the other thing that the DRI3 extension needs to do today, and probably going forward for the future, is it needs to tell the client which rendering device to talk to. You're opening up a screen. You've got a particular, um, a particular rendering target in your X server. You want to make sure you're using the right DRI device for that. Um, the way that we did that in DRI2 was we passed the file name over the, over the X protocol, and the application opened it. Um, and then we had the lovely DRI2 authentication dance, which everybody loves so much. Um, DRI3 does this a little simpler. So what's the current status of the DRI3 extension? I think the DRI3 extension is done. I don't think there's anything significantly uh, significant left to be done in the extension itself. 
Um, it has an X protocol um, in the X server. It has an XCB binding. I'm not planning on ever doing an XLIB binding for this extension. Um, it should be completely hidden inside of your DRI uh, rendering libraries, so Mesa and um, uh, VDPAU or what's the Intel one? VA. Um, whatever direct rendering libraries you have, you should be able to use them um, immediately without any trouble. Um, I have a Mesa DRI3 loader that works today. I can show you some demos shortly. There's a GLX API. Um, and so you can actually run Mesa with DRI3 and present. It works fine today. Uh, performance is kind of a bunch better than it was with DRI2 uh, because the present extension is more efficient than DRI2 about swapping buffers. Uh, the Intel Mesa and 2D drivers are all hooked up. So yeah, it's all, this all actually is kind of done and working. Uh, still left to be done is an EGL API on the application side. Um, why the Windows system API you use dictates the extension set and all of your swap buffer stuff. Yeah, thanks, GL. So I get to do another implementation in Mesa to, uh, to bind the EGL API to these new extensions as well. Um, and the part that um, Ajax has told me he's, he's going to make it so I don't have to do is the X server GL loader because the X server also has a separate binding to the Windows system APIs and it should, in theory, need to be changed to use DRI3, but Ajax says he's getting rid of all that code and that I won't have to do that, which I'm hopeful for. Um, and, of course, the other thing it needs is a bunch more test cases. It passes all the test cases I have now for this stuff, uh, but in particular, there's a bunch of new extensions that DRI3 supports correctly now, like the OML sync extensions and OML swap control and a bunch of these other extensions, which we haven't ever supported before and which have no test cases in Piglet. I think there are three test cases for the OML sync control extension. The one that lets you, the one that lets you pick which, uh, which, when to do the swap buffers. We have three test cases. Uh, DRI2 fails all of those, and DRI3 passes all of those. Three test cases. Woo! -hoo! So it's a hundred percent improvement. Um, yeah. So as usual, more testing is needed. Um, here's the DRI3 extension. This is probably an eye chart, unfortunately. Uh, but these are the four uh, extension requests in the extension. Uh, that's the whole extension right there. It has an open request, which opens a DRM device. And this is actually done with file descriptor passing. So you just say, oh, Mr. X server, or Mrs. X server, or whichever. Sorry about that. I'm not going there. Um, open, the, open the DRM device, uh, which is appropriate. Now, the one thing that I've added to DRI3 that um, DRI2 didn't have is the is the ability to specify a specific rendering target. So in render, we now have different render, we did, we now, now have different uh, render providers. And so in DOI3, you actually can, you can actually hand it one of the render, rendering providers and say, please give me a file descriptor for that rendering device. So if you have multiple rendering devices in your environment, you can select which one you want. Um, and then the file descriptor is just passed back on the X connection. So there's none of this passing the file name back and opening it later. The X server takes care of opening it, doing the current uh, authentication dance with the current kernel. Uh, when, we switch the, uh, when we switch to a 3.12 kernel and the kernel provides rendering nodes, I can just open the rendering node and pass the file descriptor from that back to the application. So this places all of the changes for the rendering node uh, updates within the X server and makes it completely transparent to all of your direct rendering applications. Now, I don't provide any information about the device other than the file descriptor. Um, and in Mesa right now, in order to figure out which, which, uh, which Mesa driver to load, I actually take that file descriptor and go find out what its PCI IDs are and go load the driver. Uh, DR, LibDRM had a, had a function that said, give it a file descriptor, figure out what Mesa driver to load. And I just use that function. So I didn't need to provide any other information on the wire. Just give me a file descriptor for the device I should be talking to. That worked out really nicely. Um, then there's, a, then there's the, the symmetrical uh, converting DMA buffs into PixMaps. PixMap from buffer and buffer from PixMap. Uh, PixMap from buffer, uh, you create a DMA buff on the application side, take a file descriptor fr from it and pump it over the X connection, and that file descriptor is then turned into a PixMap in the X server side. Really, really simple. Um, this is the, the only use I'm making of this right now is to wrap up gem buffers on the client side, send them across the connection and unwrap them back into gem buffers on the other side. Um, 
the other thing that I did with the similar file descriptor passing stuff was I hacked up the X uh, shared memory extension to pass a file descriptor to the shared memory objects that we use now. So, yeah. So the file descriptor passing stuff is, is useful for more than this, but this extension doesn't do that. This is just for passing DMA buffs. If we want to also take the changes I made to the shared memory extension and, you, and export those, that would be awesome. I don't know how useful that is because do, who uses the shared memory extension anymore? Yeah, now that it's actually secure and useful, yeah. And we could we could switch we could fix XV because XV is an awesome extension, yeah, yeah. And then, and then there's a symmetrical request buffer from PixMap that says, given a PixMap, I want to turn it into a DMA buff so I can talk to it directly. So these are the, these are the the in in GL speak the second one is the texture from PixMap. Where you have a PixMap and you want to you want to get a GL object for it, you can use uh, you can use the buffer from PixMap request while the GL implementation uses the buffer from PixMap request, gets a DMA buff, turns it into a gem object, wraps it up with all of your GL loveliness and turns it into a texture. So that gives you all the stuff you need for um, for composite in both directions. And then the last thing I have down here is a fence from FD, um, and this takes a um, this takes a chunk, a page of shared memory with a futex in it and turns it into a sync fence object, an, uh, an xsync fence object on the xserver side. So that when the xserver signals a sync fence, you can actually wait on the futex. Now currently the synchronization is one direction. The xserver can signal the futex and you could block on the futex. Um, it would be lovely if it went the other direction as well, but I'm not sure how a single-threaded X server can block on a, can get signal that a Futex is ready and, uh, and continue on at that point. I don't know how to do that. Um, yeah, fork off a special thread that's going to do the wait that sends a message through a pipe. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much the plan. It's, what? Well, yeah, it's all Unix. Um, I don't really know, how, I don't, for one thing, I have, a, I have a, a fundamental problem right now. I don't need synchronization on the Intel driver because it's all implicitly synchronized to the kernel. Um, so what I need is for people to tell me, uh, well, we need, we want to use sync fences, or we want to use sync fences for the serialization here. I would love to see a Mesa implementation that used, that needed to have uh, explicit synchronization so I can figure out how to make this actually useful. So I don't need this today. But people tell me they need synch explicit synchronization. I believe them. I just, I don't need it today myself, which is frustrating. Uh, okay. The next piece is the present extension. Uh, the present extension has recently been, the first request has recently been renamed. This is the whole extension there. Um, the first three are the requests and the last three are the um, events. I have three requests. You can say, take this pix map and please put it at, and make it be the contents of my window now. Um, you can say, hey, I want to be told when this frame time has passed. Give, send me event when this frame has passed. That's required for the crazy OpenGL extension um, to, to be able to block waiting for a particular frame to pass. Um, and then you can select for events. And that's the, whole that's the whole extension. So in reality, I mean, most applications are going to use just the first extent, uh, request and maybe select for some events. And we have three events. Um, when the, when the X server is done using your, the pix map that you pass to it, so either the copy is done or the page flip is no, the, the, the pix map is no longer being used as a scan out buffer, you'll get this idle event telling you that your pix map is, is available for reuse. This what this um, I'll show you in the next slide. This was uh, until yesterday. This was a, a fence because I thought fences were cool and I wouldn't have to wait for X events in order to block waiting for this uh, idle event. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, so it's going to be. I think it's going to be an event. I would love to know if I could not make it an event, but I don't know how. Um, the other thing I have is a configure notify. Now you're thinking, why do you need a configure notify to tell you when the window size has changed when you can just use the core protocol configure notify that kind of tells you at the same time that your window's been resized? Well, the reason for that, that I, the reason I created a new event, you're, you're all asking yourself, well, why did you do that? I'll tell you why I did that. Um, the reason I did that is because a client can select for configure notify events. The whole client 
gets one Boolean, uh, one Boolean whether it's selecting for configure notify or not. So while my extension would love to just use configure notify, it would need to know if the client also wanted to see the configure notify so that it could pass it along in the regular event stream so the client would see it as, as well as the extension. So if we're going to have the extension sealing events out of the, out of the event stream, we need to know if the client also wants to see it. And there's just no way right now in the core protocol for me to know if the client wants to see it without tracking every single configure, uh, uh, configure um, uh, change window attributes call that the client makes, which seems crazy. So what I did instead is I just said, fine, my extension is going to also send a configure notify event. And my configure notify event is guaranteed to arrive before the core configure notify event so that my library, my, my GL library, is now assured of knowing that the window has been resized before the application finds out that the window has been resized. That means that I can make sure that GL is always slightly ahead of the application. So when the application comes in and says, I'd like to draw to this window because I know that it's been resized, then my GL library can say, oh, hey, I know that too. Let me get the buffers allocated to the correct size. Um, when I was designing this stuff, I was hoping that I didn't have to have configure notify at all. The original plan was to have was to track the viewport sizes the client that the application set the GL viewport sizes and just have the application effectively implicitly tell me how big the window had gotten through the union of all of its GL viewports which was going to be awesome it's like oh the application's just going to tell me what the window size is and I'll allocate a buffer at that size well that would be awesome except GL um, it uh, would almost work for most GL rendering, except for things that don't clip to the viewport. Uh, in particular, the bitmap operations don't actually clip to the viewport. So you can do rendering outside of your viewport. Who knew? You just have to use the appropriate parts of the GL API. That made that made the that made this kind of a requirement. So the app. So when the application first starts up with GL, GL goes and queries the current window size to allocate the buffers in appropriate size, and then it sets this thing to please send it an event every time it, uh, the size changes. And I'll talk about the XCB changes necessary to make that work. And then there's the other, the other side of the, the, uh, the, other side of the present uh, PixMap. When the presentation is actually completed, so when your PixMap is actually being scanned out on the window, you get another event that tells you precisely when that occurred at what frame count. So it gives you the system time of the first pixel in the frame that was scanning out with your new contents, and it gives you the media stream counter of the same frame. Thank you, complicated extensions. Uh, the present PixMap request uh, provides a whole pile of parameters. It's got, um, one of the things that I stuck in it is a serial number, so that if you do a bunch of presentation requests, you can actually figure out which one completed. So your complete event comes back with whatever number you provide to it. So if you, wanna, if you don't care when they complete and you don't have any state, you can just stuff zero in there. I don't use it except to hand it back to you when it completes. Um, then there's two regions. There's a valid area and an update area. The valid area says what part of the PixMap that you're handing to the server actually contains stuff that could appear on the screen. And the update area says what part of the PixMap that you're handing to the X server must appear on the screen. And the server is free to copy whatever subset of the update of the valid area which contains the update area that it wants. So if you want to do page flipping, uh, and be efficient in your multi-buffering like my window manager does, then what you do is you, is you make sure the valid area is the size of the entire screen, but then you make, th make the update area be the smallest area that contains all the changes that you made. And so if the X server can do a page flip, it's going to say, oh, well, the entire thing is valid. I can use page flipping. It's very efficient. But if it can't do page flipping for some reason, it can say, oh, I only need to blit this tiny little region. Let me efficiently copy the smallest possible area. That means the X server gets a bunch of flexibility in which whether it wants to do page flipping or copying. Um, there's an X and Y offset within the region. Um, obviously, if you set this to non-zero, then all of a sudden your entire window contents aren't being replaced because of PixMap's offset within that. Um, this isn't really for applications. This is more for compositing managers where they want to pass through a present from another application and get it positioned on the screen at the right place. Um, although applications can use this, um, so composite, it, is, it does make it a little more complex. It says, yeah, don't, this isn't the entire contents of my window. This is just a piece of my window. So you could actually do a, a subset of your window update using this offset and just blit a small section onto the screen. So this gives you all the capabilities of copy area, 
um, except vertical blank synchronized. And so if you want to do just if you want to do just uh, blitz that are synchronized, you can use this request. Um, and then it has a, a fence to wait for before the op, before the blit or scan out occurs. So if your 3D engine is busy rendering stuff and you've got a fence set at the end of that rendering operation, then you hand that fence to the X server. And before the X server puts new contents on the, win on the screen, it waits for that fence. That wait is not synchronous in execution of requests. That wait is blocking the execution of the copy. So that, that's all asynchronous. So once the request gets executed and all the state gets saved in the X server, and then when the wait fires and the frame count occurs, then the contents get put on the screen. Um, there's a, a flag of a bunch of options that you can set. I, I think I have a list of the options here. Uh, nope, no list of options. Uh, one of the options that I thought would be interest would be nice to have in here is a please always copy. I'm not willing to deal with the complexities of flipping because when you're doing flipping, you have to deal with the fact that your Pixmap is going to be busy long past the completion of the operation. So if you have a simple application that just wants to do, you know, copying-based double buffering, you can say, you know, that flipping stuff seems really hard. Let me just set the always copy me flag and make it simpler. Uh, then there's the target media stream counter and the divisor and remainder. That, that, those are three parts that you can read about the complex semantics in the, in the GL extension uh, that tells effectively when to put your frame on the screen. And if you want to do every frame, if you just want to have it, have, it, uh, have it happen at the next frame, you just set all those to zero, and you'll, you'll happen at the next frame. Oh, one of the other options I stuck in there was, was um, don't wait for vblank. Just do it right now, please. Um, and, that, and if you set the target MSC to the next frame and say, or what, what you think is the next frame, and say, please don't wait, then even if you've missed that next frame, uh, even if, you, if you've missed the next frame, it'll cut through and put the contents on the screen as soon as possible. Um, I think everybody's hardware does that these days. Does anybody know of 3D hardware or uh, scanout hardware that can't switch midstream between two scanouts? Which one? Well, some lame embedded crap. <laughs> yeah, sucks for them. All the, all the useful, useful desktop hardware seems to do this just fine. Um, and of course, uh, and of course, the one of the things you can find out about is whether that's supported or not. Uh, yeah, some hardware, not so much. Uh, this is going to let us. This is going to let us actually do the thing that games want, which is please give me 60 hertz. And oh, if I've just barely missed, yeah, start right now. Don't uh, don't give me judder. Um, what? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Good question. Yeah, so, so one of the things you could do, for instance, uh, Firefox may want to use this when it's tiling system to like actually get the tiles all presented at vblank time. It can hand me six of these requests all for, all for, the, same, uh, all for the same frame. You go blit, 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 and have the new frame updated synchronously and with all the appropriate offsets to get stuff on the screen. That should just work. Um, and the final thing that it's got here, oh, I have options listed twice. That's useful. You can tell this has been edited a few times. The final thing is a list of windows to notify that this has been that, that, that their operation is dependent upon this operation, and so you should pretend like their operation is completed, and send them events. And that's for redirection. So essentially, if you're doing uh, redirected compositing and you're gathering up all these redirected composite operations into one master pix map and then presenting that one master pix map you want to go tell all the dependent applications that their present operations are also complete at the same time that yours completes because yours is putting their contents on the screen and so you can give this extra list of windows uh, obviously this supports uh, v, v blank synchronized sub window updates so you can do you know whatever small tiny little region copies you want and have them uh, have them have them synchronized um, because you have these two regions again you can do updates uh, you can do uh, flips for even small updates uh, which is really nice um, and I separated out the completion from the idle event because otherwise you can't do flips at all uh, which really sucks uh, this is what the present region that in in the code that I'm running on my machine which is different from the code that I'm compiling on my machine this is what it does uh, this is, and I wanted to tell you about the differences so we could explain uh, what's changed. Uh, before the current implementation that I'm running, I uh, didn't have a wait fence because I don't need it on Intel. 
and I was talking with some uh, the Mali driver implementers at uh, LinuxCon and Plumbers last week, and they said, hey, you know, we've got this multi-stream stuff. We really need to be able to do this synchronization. It's like, oh, right. That's why the fences are in there is to do exactly this synchronization. I kind of forgot about that direction, um, and so I added the wait fence. Um, and the idle fence, I've got another section about that um, coming along uh, shortly. Um, I didn't have options before, and so applications couldn't say, hey, I really can't do flipping, or hey, you know, I really, really, really want to do the cut-through stuff if you can. And, of course, I added the window list for the... Uh, this is amazing. I've got this preview of the slide, and it's rendered completely differently than it is on the screen. That's really weird looking. Um, so what did I have to do to XCB to make this work? Well, the first obvious thing I had to do to XCB to make DRI3 work is I had to support file descriptor passing. Um, that actually turned out to be really easy once I just accepted the fact that I was going to have to just use replace all usages of read or receive with receive message. Receive message is the kernel API that lets you pass data and your file descriptors at the same time. And if you ever call read or receive and there are file descriptors pending, oh, they get closed and not passed to you. Sorry. Um, so if you ever want to be able to receive the file descriptors, you always have to use receive message. And so I just hacked up uh, XCB so that it always uses receive message, and I hacked up the X server in the same way. Um, was there a performance difference? N no. Uh, so this seems like, uh, seems like a fine change. Um, and then the other thing I do when you do the receive message and you discover, hey, I got file descriptors, you just scroll them away and expect that the, re the reply handler that's going to actually need them is going to get called. Uh, fortunately, XCB calls the reply, reply handlers in the order the replies were received. And so if the file descriptors are neatly queued, then the file descriptors get you know, nicely FIFO'd uh, from in the inbound socket into the appropriate uh, re re replies. So you get a reply structure. It's got all the reply data. And then it's got this array of file descriptors allocated after it. You can pass as many file descriptors as you want. Uh, I think there's a limit of like 100. I set a limit of like 128 per receive. Um, which seemed like plenty. I don't know. Because uh, you have to pre-allocate the array to actually get the inbound file descriptors. Um, the good thing is in the kernel, the file descriptors are actually aligned with a specific block of data that was written at some point. And so if you do a receive and you don't have enough buffer space for all the file descriptors that are queued up for 4K of data, then you're going to get a short read and 128 file descriptors. The kernel is kind of bizarre. So as long as the other side doesn't do a write with more than 128 file descriptors, then things work fine. So you just kind of have to agree between the X server and the application that you're going to be good about queuing your writes uh, to not include too many file descriptors per write. Uh, fortunately, uh, my requests take one file descriptor, and so usually the number that you're getting in any particular read is exactly one. The other thing that I've done to XCB is I've created these special event queues. And these are event queues that are actually matching specific events as they're being read off the wire and squirreling them away into a new event queue. So you have your main event queue, which takes most of the events coming from the X server, and then you have your special event queues. How am I doing the matching? Well, I'm doing the matching. They're always XGE events, always the uh, generic extension uh, matching, which means that I can match on a specific opcode for a specific extension. And then furthermore, I've added a magic event ID uh, to all of these events. So when you actually do a select input with present, uh, you're not selecting for a, particular, uh, for a particular client. You're actually creating an event, uh, dis uh, event distribution context with a special magic uh, XID. And that event ID receives the events. So one client can actually select for multiple events of the same type using different event IDs. And that means that your application level can select for present events, and the OpenGL library can separately select for the same events. And yes, I could have sent one event and somehow muxed it out to the two event queues, but I, th I thought, you know, what's really simple to do here is to just have the X server send two of the same event with these different event ID contexts. And so these special event queues are looking for XGE events that have a specific event ID, and you, and you can create a new event queue per event ID. And that makes it pretty simple. Um, yeah, Stuart. With ePoll? 
No, no, no. This isn't. This, these aren't. These aren't uh, kernel events. These are X events. Yeah, this is just use the regular event X events. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing that the special events do is you can hand them a pointer to an integer, and every time an event comes in, they bump that integer. And you're thinking, why would you do something so crazy? You can just go look at the event queue and see if it's empty or not. Well, in Mesa, in uh, Mesa has this special, oh, something has changed to your window. You might want to go revalidate all of your window contents. And that happens to be an integer. And if that integer gets changed, it goes and calls, uh, calls into the, uh, into the uh, xlib understanding parts of the uh, driver. And so I just hand the pointer to that integer down into XCB, and XCB will automatically smash it. So it's a very inexpensive test in Mesa every time it's going to find out what your current drawable is to see if the, if the drawable is still correct. And if it isn't, it can jump out and do the expensive stuff. So that turned out to be a good Mesa-specific hack that I'm sure nobody else will use, but Mesa is a pretty important XCB client. So it seemed reasonable to do that. How am I doing for time? Uh, media stream counters. Um, this was kind of an adventure, and this is something that I don't know what DRI2 does, but it's not done a very good job of it. Uh, media stream counters are supposed to be monotonically increasing counters that, that are increased every time a frame is displayed by your monitor. Well, if you have one monitor that never turns off, this is a really simple notion. You get 60 or however many of these per second, and it just goes on forever. And if you want to wait for frame 100, well, you know, frame 100 is going to be you know, a second and a little more than a second since frame zero. And it's a really easy counting notion to synchronizing your video and audio. Um, some of the challenges are, uh, well, what happens when you switch between monitors? Well, this monitor works at 59 hertz, and this monitor works at 61 hertz because randomness. So this one has numbers that are different from this one. If I move the application from this window, from this screen to this screen, then all of a sudden, if I had all of my media stream counters zeroed when the X server started, then this one's going to be way behind. And all of a sudden, when I move the window across, it's either going to uh, e either going to um, do frames really quickly for a long time, or it's going to pause for a couple of minutes before it displays anything. Neither of those is good. Uh, the other adventure happens when you turn the monitors off and there aren't any frames happening at all. What do we do then? Uh, what happens when the machine suspends and resumes? What happens when we VT switch? Uh, those are very similar to turning the monitor off. Suspend and resume is a little different because your application isn't running either. Um, so the current design is that each window gets its own media stream counter domain effectively. Uh, and so when you want to when you want to wait for a particular frame, all those frame numbers are relative, relative to a particular window. And so when that window gets moved between monitors, then I need to rebase the media stream counter offset from the physical, uh, phys from, the from the global offset for that screen and keep track of this base. So that when you move between, um, so the funny thing is if you take two windows and you move one to one monitor and back to this monitor, then all of a sudden they have the, those if you and you have left the other other window fixed on this monitor then they're going to have different media stream counter offsets because you moved it to another monitor it's clocking at a different rate and you move it back and all of a sudden it's clocking at that lower rate on the for turning monitors off i created a fake counter so any time a any time a window isn't on any uh, clocking monitor at all or your monitors are all turned off uh, then i have a fake counter and so that counter runs at a particular rate. Uh, right now, for testing, I set the rate at 60 hertz. That's probably not what we want. When you're DPMS your screen, you'd really like all your applications to slow way down. Um, I don't know what rate, rate to run the fake counter at. What, how fast? You know, you could think that what you want to do is have all the applications stop completely. But that really breaks a lot of applications. They get really confused if they're not doing any updates. And so I'm thinking we just want to clock them way down so that dumb applications will go really slowly and smart applications can say, oh, look, the monitor's turned off. We should not do anything now. How fast should I run my fake frame rate at when all the monitors turn off? What do you think? Yep. Well, I was, I was going to suggest maybe not 
implementing this particular extension in GL anymore and just defining something that isn't garbage. And if old applications that wanted media stream counters, that, that wanted the OML sync extension or whatever, exist, it's tough because they had to work anyway without it. And, and, and we've already said, like, you cannot define reasonable semantics here because the domain of the, of, your, of the frame rate that you're trying to talk about is 60 frames FPS on, one, on output one and 75 on output two, and they're both the same screen. The fact that GL doesn't know what render objects are means that we cannot possibly implement this rationally. I think you are, you are pr probably better off ignoring the MSC extension. Could I, you, you could be right. I, maybe using that, but even still, I well, want to. I want to know. I want to know uh, what a frame is on each window, and when. If if you're if you're if if you want to render one frame of of information for every frame of the output, then you still have this notion of of, of logical frame sequencing, right? One frame to the next. Well, so the other problem with the the MSC MSC extension is. Apps can ask what the rate is. Yeah, and they ask once. So if you're changing it, I don't know what they'll do. And if you're, if they're moving, I mean, the whole thing is just broken sure. in multi-monitor setups. Right. So Adam might be right. Maybe we should just not do that extension. Just let this one, you know, burn down, fall over, sink into the swamp, and we'll build another one. Did is is there a plausible replacement that gives us the control of? Uh, please update once a frame, because uh, there isn't I, any other extension that does this I, function, which is useful function. And and Andy has a comment. So it might be useful to look at VDPAU's presentation queue. So that's all uh, GPU timer based. So rather than talking about frames, you talk about. I mean, you still have to pick a, dom a time domain, right. and it's challenging in multi GPU scenarios, but. Um, you say, I want this frame to be presented at this time in whatever time domain you define. And then you get feedback, if I recall correctly, on when the presentation actually happened. Well, uh, that, and the OML sync extension gives us exactly that same notion. You can well, say... With, with, with coarser granularity. Uh, it, it, the, time, the time of presentation actually gives you a, a microsecond level granularity of fr frame presentation. Um, what I've been told repeatedly by the GStreamer people is that if they can't reason about a timer, then it doesn't matter. Um, like, you can get amazingly accurate uh, hardware timers, but if they can't then relate that to clock monotonic or whatever they're using to drive the audio stuff, then it's useless to them. Right, and fortunately, in my environment, I can I'm using clock monotonic for these times. Right, but uh, yeah, as long as it's actually that, because otherwise right. they... I, I, I don't think there'd be... The, pr the problem is in some embedded hardware, <laughs> The embedded hardware uh, 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 timestamps that it gives on the frame information coming back from the hardware is not clock monotonic. It's in some totally Martian time domain that's not referenceable. Yeah, we're making them fix that. Um, the other um, nice thing that I don't know if VDPAU does this, but the NV uh, present queue GL extension does, um, aside from not making a massive amount of sense to me, at least in general. Um, <laughs> But it does, uh, yeah, it gives you a queue with each frame has a target MSC range. Um, so you can say, this frame should be displayed no earlier than this, but no later than this, and so on. So if you miss it, you actually get to drop and do the reasonable thing on the assumption that you've probably already queued up that much audio as well. Okay. Um, in the present extension right now, if you actually present multiple frames and there's two frames that are going to be presented at the same count because you've missed, then that second frame will get dropped already. So if you have a, if you have a queue and you say, please present a frame at, one, at, at MSC 1, 2, 3, and you miss frame 2, you don't get it displayed, and you're about to display it frame 3 time, and you've got, now you've got two presents to occur both at frame 3, the first one gets dropped. So that's different. Is that a use? Is that is this range notion useful when what you really want to do is catch up? I don't know. So on the note of um, couldn't we just delete this extension? We do know that we have an active consumer of this extension on Intel. Um, we know this because it's the person that rewrote all of our code to actually work. Um, so we do have people actually relying on the 
um, OML sync control that provides all these MSC counters um, and is actually cares about accurate timing of them on single monitor situations. <sighs> I wanted to delete it too. <laughs> Andy's got more comments. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, people have asked us for this extension from time to time as well. And um, the reason we haven't implemented it on NVIDIA yet is it's really, really hard to do in our hardware. We don't actually have the counter that we need. Um, we've been talking about how we could fake it kind of with some other counters, but we either burn a lot of power or we do crazy, crazy stuff and probably don't get it very, very accurate. No, uh, we, have, we have a hardware counter. So we don't have to turn the interrupts on. No, the current software does the right thing. It turns the interrupts off and reads the, reads the counter out of the hardware. Yeah, and uh, for possible another replacement, I suggested before having some kind of fence object that, that at least lets you do when you put this fence object in front of your presenter or whatever, uh, it, it waits for a V-Sync. Um, and maybe you could predicate before that, wait for at least a certain time to pass. And that time can maybe be a CPU time before it gets sent down to the hardware to the actual V-Blank wait. And if the V-Blank, or maybe if the time's too far past, just don't send the V-Blank wait down to the hardware. Um, right. So you kind of separate the two. You have the time and the, the V-Blank wait separated out. So you can keep the time on the, the common time domain and the V-Blank on the hardware where it belongs. Th that, that ends up giving you a bunch of judder, though, when you're trying to do frames at 24 hertz on a 30 hertz monitor. Is that what you end up getting automatically, kind of? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to try to not present at 30 frames a second on a 24 frames per second monitor or right. vice versa. Or do some kind of motion blur in your hardware before you do that. <laughs> yeah, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, at the application side, hopefully, hopefully right. not as part of the present. Right. So I guess I don't know what to do here. Um, we could throw away the support for this extension in this in present and not be able to do this extension at all. Yeah, that mic was stuck. That mic was no, it's, it just gets muted when it gets passed around people. Uh, it's not necessarily necessary to implement support for OML sync counter in 1.0 of the present extension either. You could have present PixMap and then present PixMap EX in 1.1. If what we're concerned about is, is do we get this working at all for a DRI 3 by, well, it, say, October? This part was easy. None of this was hard. This is the easy part of present, right? It's a, it, the, the, the question is, is it useful? Well, <laughs> it is, uh, apparently, if there, are, if there are apps that are using it, if there are people that have tried to, implement, to fix our current implementation, right. then it must be used, if not useful. Right. That my, my concern with the extension is that it provides some unique functionality, which is not present in other extensions. The full complexity of this extension is clearly, is clearly you know, from Mars. Yeah. But in particular, the ability to do, you know, the ability to do one frame per frame, we don't have anything else that does that. Well, Dave says I'm not allowed to release without OML, so without the, the OML sync extension according to IRC. So I consider that suggestion okay. withdrawn. So the fact that the fact that this passes passes all known tests for OML that makes it good, huh? <laughs> but well, let's put that more yeah more accurately. Both known tests for OML. Okay. And so I, I mean, it's probably great to add OML where it's supported. Um, I'm worried about it being baked into the extension if we can ever support it on our hardware, or if it makes our well, hardware uh, uh, really bad. It is a, a best effort notion. And, of course, one of the things that OML gives you is if you pass zero in for the MSC that you want to be displayed at that says, uh, please, how about the next one? That would be awesome. So it, most applications in the GL that I've done right now, um, uh, they, it, it, when the, unless the application is asking for OML sync control explicitly through the GL API, then the stuff I put on the wire uh, wouldn't require any hardware support at all because it would just pass a zero through for the target MSC, which means, and then you pass a zero for divisor and remainder, and that means, how about the next frame? That would be awesome. Okay. So it's not, gonna, it's not putting any additional burden on your implementation at all. If you don't support it today and you, and you, and you weren't, and the applications weren't asking for it, it would work fine. I mean, GLX has the 
concept of an extension string, though. But this is not baked into GLI, so it can be used separately. Is there some kind of way to advertise support for the OML part or not advertise support for the OML part? Okay, so maybe there? maybe present needs to say whether it can actually do this or not. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. He keeps turning the mic off, though, Ajax. Um, I mean, the, the list of options that you had anyway, as it stands for, for the present extension, for the present request, how am I, those, those are options, right? How am I to know which ones of them are legal at all? Is the right, so there, I would need to put a query thing that said which options were supported and a bunch of query flags. Yeah. 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 That seems quite plausible. I can do that. And then, then, then the application could know if it was supported or not. And then the GL implementation would know whether it was supported or not. Although, frankly, because the GL implementation is tied in tightly with your GL driver, your driver would just strip out the OML sync control part and never advertise it. Because using present in your, your driver would be the one do it using present, right? This isn't visible to the application. This isn't some shared code. This is per driver code. You say that, but you just said that you were consistent. Like, I, I remember earlier conversations about this where you're saying that GNOME Shell would be using present as the instead of swap buffers. Yep. Yep. So I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to need to advertise it. Okay. And it wouldn't really be in the driver, it'd be in libgl, right? Yeah, Which yeah. Is the layer right above the driver. So. Yeah, Tomato, it, it makes sense for the, it. Yeah, yeah, that layer talks to the driver, but right. yeah, it, it still makes sense, I think, to have the, the queries there because yep. then it could just sort it all out. Ooh, another request from three to four. It's like a 25%, 33% expansion in my extension. Okay. Um, so, anybody have any opinions on how fast the fake frame counter should run? So, if you're if you're getting an application that says, please, please up uh, please send me an event once per frame so I can draw a new frame and there's nothing to show. How fast should that go? Zero hertz? What? How fast should it go? I can give you a good answer for this on Linux. Uh, we have timer slack. Oh. And you can query it. So just do that. How long would that be? Whatever the OS policy said to do. Oh. If you wanted, if your OS policy said, you know, your timer slack is 10 seconds if you don't have anything real time coming up, then you wake up every, once every 10 seconds, and that's how often you bump the MSC. And your audio skews a bit. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's, if, you're, if you're paused, yeah, yeah. then nothing happens. Right. right? Um, but if you wanted, you could probably look at the timer slack from okay. the kernel and say, I like that answer. That. That, that, puts, that puts the responsibility on somebody else. <laughs> always, always delegate responsibility. Part. Okay. Thank you, Ajax. Timer slack. Okay, uh, what's the status of present? Uh, the protocol that is not documented up here, but a, a protocol somewhat like that that does similar things um, is all working. Uh, the XCB, Mesa, XLib, bind I did XLib bindings for this and I felt bad. Um, the problem is, is that the demo that I'm doing for a present-based compositing manager is using the Metacity code base because it's the simplest plausible compositing manager that I have. Unfortunately, it uses xlib. And in order to get the present events back into it, I had to do the whole xlib binding for this extension so that it could get present events up into Metacity. Even though Metacity was happy enough calling the XCB uh, protocol requests, there was no way to do the event processing without xlib support for the extension. I felt bad about that. Uh, Yeah, obviously. If you're going to encourage existing applications to move from swap buffers to present, yeah. then it's reasonable to give them XLib access. Yes. Um, to just do the requests, you wouldn't need to because you can always call XCB from any XLib application. Sure. Uh, but in order to handle the events, I didn't have any choice. So uh, obviously, it's in the Intel Mesa and 2D drivers. Um, I would love to see this in another Mesa driver. It's not a huge amount of work. Um, I don't have any non-Intel hardware. So maybe I'll just buy some non-Intel hardware. Or maybe I'll make somebody else do the work. Um, that would be lovely. Is that somebody sighing? <laughs> maybe it'll happen in Nouveau? <laughs> no, huh? Okay. What? <laughs> yeah. I'm getting laughed at. 
Oh, I see. Okay. Well, the good thing is the good thing is that with present and DRI three, my the most important benchmark of all. Most important GL benchmark okay. of all. <laughs> yes, it gets dramatically faster. <laughs> so you get imp performance improvement. Um, the second proto protocol proposal, obviously, it's being dynamically updated as we speak. Um, I've added what I know about. I'm going to add the ability to query a bunch of options, optional support in the driver. Um, if other people have other stuff they'd like to have in this, apparently we have till the end of October to get it finished up. But I'm pretty comfortable with the stuff that we have done already. Do you have more stuff? Daniel, you don't even work on X anymore. You don't, you don't get a vote. I know that's what makes this even better. <laughs> you know what I said about delegating? Um, the wait fence stuff um, yeah. requires round trip? Yes. No, no, of course not. Okay, good man. Why would it require a round trip? So, so basically, because this is X. you construct on the client side, you pass it to the server, which and th then it becomes a, an X sync extension fence object. And then now you have a fence object, and you can, the present extension takes that fence object, and you can block on it. So any, X, any sync fence object, like the current NVIDIA sync fences, that your GL driver magically constructs, I don't know how those work, uh, those go into the present extension. So however you create an X-Sync fence object, it goes into the present extension. The present extension blocks the presentation until that fence is signaled. All within the X server, no round trips. Right, so you can do that without waiting for the reply on the client side. There's no reply. Cool. Sweet. Yeah, in fact, the present extension has no replies currently, although you just asked for a synchronous request to query the options supported by the extension. So it's going to grow a reply. Um, yeah, my other feedback slash heckle was to re remove the only question mark on that slide. Where's the only question mark? Next to YUV. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, we're going to add, add, add the options and the, and the wait fence, get rid of the idle fence, uh, construct idle events. Now, to do, um, I think the synchronization stuff, is that plausible for you guys? Just a, f a sync fence object that gets handed to the present pix map request is that sufficient or do you need different so i guess i was waiting were you going to talk some more about the the idle event coming back and everything and why that can't be a fence um it, oh why can't it be a fence um i have another slide on that the reason it can't be a fence is because i have two or more buffers on a single uh, on, uh, for a single window, right? And any of them may become idle at any time. And how do I know which one is idle? More importantly, well, I can just check the status of the fences. How do I wait for the, con the disjunction of a collection of fence objects on the client side? I want to wait for one of these four things. I want to wait with the CPU for one of these four objects to become idle so I can start using it. I don't know which one's going to become idle first. If they're not allocated in a round robin notion they aren't they aren't freed in a round robin notion because i do i do presentation elision so um, i don't remember at this point but i thought there was a request to do that city i'm going to the bar because the x server always knows how to find a bar <laughs> right that's always the plan um but I think I probably want to do the more complicated mechanism so that I can do the over-allocation and my magic page, uh, page level uh, flipping stuff that I talked about at LCA. Um, I'm going to implement the simple stuff uh, because that's the bulk of the semantics in terms of getting a compositor working, and I want to be able to demonstrate that pretty soon. Um, and I think I'll leave the more complicated stuff for the future. Um, in fact, I don't think I'll do... I'm not planning on doing any of the redirection stuff for version one of the present extension. Um, my only concern is that present PixMap has that some additional semantics in there that are designed for redirection, and not doing the redirection would leave those untested, which may, may mean that would may, may, we may discover that they're completely useless and wrong, which always sucks. Um, so I'm tempted to either rip those out or actually try the simple redirection and try to get it working. Uh, it depends on how much coding I get done next week.
Well, this this it, this would be easy to tell because it would be a minor version change in the extension. Okay, I, I was just going to say if if you're going to put in a mechanism anyway to detect that some features are optional, yeah. then we could have this be one of those features, and if we determine it's useless, then you just make it so that bit is never set. <laughs> yeah, well, th this is this is a Dix level feature, not a hardware feature, and I'm trying to save the the feature the feature bits for stuff the hardware can do or not. This is just whether the extension has the semantic or not. Um, and so I, my, I think I'll probably just go to try to go try to implement it and make it work. I don't think it's going to take very long. Um, and then I'll know if it works or not, and that will be awesome. Okay, so idle fences and wait fences. I had that version last week. Um, <laughs> and we'll get rid of the idle events, and I'll try to figure out some event mechanism to wake the server up on the fences so I can do the synchronization both ways. Sounds awesome. Excellent. So, so I was curious why the um, uh, the configure notifier was in present rather than the DRA three extension. It seems like more of a DRA three theme to me. Why? Why? What's a, DRA, a present feature? Uh, yeah, the the present configure notify event. Uh, because applications are going to want to know when the pix map that they need to allocate for a present change uh, when the when the requirements for that change. But, but for applications, they would use configure notify, wouldn't they? Uh, you can imagine uh, the same, exactly the same problem. Any other extension using present, any other uh, API using present that's not application visible also needs to be able to trap these configure notify events and not not get them seen through the application event queue. It's exact. GL is just a, a library that an application uses that happens to use present. There are other libraries that happen to use present that want to hide these events from the regular application X event queue. So those, those other extensions mechanism. not be using DRA3, though? Oh, no, definitely not. Okay. Presents totally separate. Like, you guys aren't going to use, you guys are going to need this present notify to know when to reallocate your underlying back buffers, and you aren't going to use DRI3. We have some other thing to do that, but. You, you, yeah. need, an, you need an event from the X server telling you when your windows change size, right? No, we have some other thing, but it's, that's orthogonal, I think. I, I think the the point is about you know separating you know what's implementation internal what versus right. what's application facing, right? So this this is designed to be used for the internal implementation of a lib of an API library that will use the present extension. Yeah. So a, vi a, a a video presentation library or a three D presentation library or anything else. So I don't think it's DRI three specific. It certainly doesn't yeah. have any DRI3 objects in it. Yeah. It's less DRI3 specific than, it's less direct rendering specific than having the fences in the present uh, PixMap request, for instance, yeah. which are stuck in there specifically to support direct rendering. Okay, fair enough. Okay, good question, though. So thank you all very much for a lot of interaction there. I've got, really learned a lot today, and I appreciate that. We'll move on to the next present. Oh, well, we're having a break now, we're we moving on. Well, what, what's the schedule say, IDR? City, city. I'm going to the bar. Because the X server always knows how to find a bar. <laughs> right? That's always the plan. Um, but I think I probably want to do the more complicated mechanism so that I can do the over allocation and my magic page, uh, page level uh, flipping stuff that I talked about at LCA. Um, I'm going to implement the simple stuff um, because that's the bulk of the semantics in terms of getting a compositor working, and I want to be able to demonstrate that pretty soon. Um, and I think I'll leave the more complicated stuff for the future. Um, in fact, I don't think I'll do... I'm not planning on doing any of the redirection stuff for version 1 of the present extension. Um, my only concern is that present PixMap has that some additional semantics in there that are designed for redirection, and not doing the redirection would leave those untested, which may, may mean them would may, may we may discover that they're completely useless and wrong, which always sucks. Um, so I'm tempted to either rip those out or actually try the simple redirection and try to get it working. Uh, it depends on how much coding I get done next week. Well, this this it, this would be easy to tell because it would be a minor version change in the extension. Okay, I, I was just going to say if if you're going to put in a mechanism anyway to detect that some features are optional, yeah, 
then we could have this be one of those features, and if we determine it's useless, then you just make it so that bit is never set. <laughs> yeah, well, th this is th this is a Dix level feature, not a hardware feature, and I'm trying to save the the feature the feature bits for stuff the hardware can do or not. This is just whether the extension has the semantic or not, um, and so I my I think I'll probably just go to try to go try to implement it and make it work. I don't think it's going to take very long, um, and then I'll know if it works or not, and that will be awesome. Okay, so idle fences and wait fences. I had that version last week. Um, <laughs> and we'll get rid of the idle events, and I'll try to figure out some event mechanism to wake the server up on the fences so I can do the synchronization both ways. Sounds awesome. Excellent. So, so I was curious why the... Um uh, the configure notifier was in present rather than the DRA3 extension. It seems like more of a DRA3 theme to me. Why, why what's a, DRA, a present feature? Uh, yeah, the, the present configure notify event. Uh, because applications are going to want to know when the picks map that they need to allocate for a present change, uh, when, the, when the requirements for that change. But, but for applications, they would use configure notify, wouldn't they? Uh, you can imagine uh, the same, exactly the same problem. Any other extension using present any other uh, API using present that's not application visible also needs to be able to trap these configure notify events and not not get them seen through the application event queue. It's exact, GL is just a, a library that an application uses that happens to use present. There are other libraries that happen to use present that want to hide these events from the regular application X event queue. So but those, those other extensions mechanism. not be using DRA3 though? Oh no, definitely not. Okay. Presents totally separate. Like, you guys aren't going to use, you guys are going to need this present notified to know when to reallocate your underlying back buffers, and you aren't going to use DRI3. We have some other thing to do that, but. You, you, yeah. need an, you need an event from the X server telling you when your windows change size, right? No, we have some other thing, but it's, that's orthogonal, I think. I, I think the the point is about you know, separating you know, what's implementation internal what versus right. what's application facing. Right. So this this is designed to be used for the internal implementation of a lib of an API library that will use the present extension. Yeah. So a, vi a a video presentation library or a three D presentation library or anything else. So I don't think it's DRI three specific. It certainly doesn't yeah. have any DRI three objects in it. Yeah. It's less DRI three specific than is less direct rendering specific than having the fences in the present uh, PixMap request, for instance. Yeah which are stuck in there specifically to support direct rendering. Okay, fair enough. Okay, good question, though. Thank you all very much for a lot of interaction there. I've got really learned a lot today, and I appreciate that. We'll move on to the next pre Oh, well, we're having a break now, or are we moving on? Well, what, what's the schedule say, IDR?